mute themselves. And if they have a, a question, they can always, you are now being recorded. Um, and if you have a question, you can push your space bar. So I, I will now um, put it over to Victoria. Okay, well, thanks Ian. Well, I thought I'd start this introduction by asking you to think back to when you were 21 years old. Last year. <laughs> yeah, I don't, well, I don't know about you, but I was pretty brainless at that age, unlike tonight's guest speaker. So not only does Liren Gertzman have youth going for him, he's also got a remarkable talent as well. His wildlife photography has received international awards and his photos have been displayed in the Natural History Museum in London and the Smithsonian uh, Museum in Washington, DC. So that's not bad for a local 21 year old, I think. And Fabulous. tonight, yeah, tonight Liren's going to enthuse on a topic that's dear to his heart, his favorite place on earth, which is Northern BC. So please join me in welcoming Liren to BMN. Thanks for coming, Liren. Woo. Yay. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I, I will need uh, the host permissions to share my screen, but I'm all ready to go here. Oh, do we do. I'm um, not, not sure if we made him a co-host. Forgot. Whoops. Hmm. <laughs> it can be done. Yeah, I was just looking. Uh, the other option is to enable participant sharing. There it is. Have you got him now? Do you want me to do that? Yeah, yeah. I don't know why it's it's doing something funny. It's coming up and saying pin. I don't know what that means. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll. Uh, maybe, maybe you have to do. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. I can. I can do that. Uh, yeah. Okay. You know, I may not, I mean, you may have to make me a co-host. I may not even be a, because I changed the oh, host over to you. Of course. Uh, well, Brian, you focus on getting yeah, Liron. Yeah. 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 Liron is now a co-host. Perfect. Yeah, Excellent. I'm good. Oh, oh now get to Ian. All right. How is this? Can everyone see my screen okay? It's coming in. Yeah. All right. Perfect. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, it's so great to be presenting for you today virtually. And, and thank you very much to Victoria for the introduction. Um, I'm really excited. This, this presentation in particular is one of my favorites to give because as Victoria mentioned, I'm going to be talking about Northern British Columbia, which of all the places I've visited is my favorite place on earth. Um, I just have so many incredible memories and you'll probably see why in the, in the coming hour uh, you'll, you'll see why I love this place so much. There's a lot of things that make it really, really special. So this image that you see here is of the Salmon Glacier um, in Northwestern British Columbia. And the Salmon Glacier is a remnant of the last ice age. It's one of the largest glaciers in North America that remains today. I believe it's the fourth largest, um, somewhere around there. Um, and pretty much what you see here is just miles and miles and miles of ice. Um, this particular image is like a massive panorama that I did. Um, so it's like super high resolution and you can zoom in and see all the details in the ice, but this place is just spectacular. But the reason why I like to bring this up is because one of the things we'll be talking about today that makes Northern BC so special for, for in general, but especially for the birds, is its biogeographical history. And during the last ice age, um, several thousand years ago, most of British Columbia and pretty much all of Northern BC was under glaciers, under cool. ice, with the exception of just a few coastal uh, refuges that were not. Um, and um, the biogeography of this region is absolutely fascinating. And we'll be talking more about that. But this here is a remnant of that last ice age. Like so many other glaciers in the world, it is receding very quickly. And we'll be talking about how the ways that climate change is having an effect on the region as well. But before I go further, um, I wanted to just tell you a little bit more about myself. This is a photo of me taken by a friend of mine, Ian Harland, who's a really great photographer. Um, and this is in Kluani National Park in the Yukon, which is right on the on the BC border. It kind of the border of southwestern uh, Yukon 
and Northwestern British Columbia, just inside the Yukon is Kulani National Park. It's a beautiful place. But what I like to do is, as, as you probably know, is I love photography, I love birds, um, but I also love science and biology. I study biology at the University of British Columbia. So what I love to do and what I'll be doing for you today is combining my passion for science and ornithology with my love of storytelling and photography and art to communicate to you just how incredible this place is. So without further ado, here's a look at British Columbia. And you'll notice right away, of course, if, you, if you've ever seen a satellite picture of British Columbia before, that, that we have a lot of mountains. And if we look up in the north of BC, we've got a few mountain ranges coming through. Um, you'll notice on the kind of eastern side of British Columbia, we've got the Rocky Mountains. Um, and the Rocky Mountains are basically a big barrier between Western and Eastern species. And you'll notice that the Northeastern corner of British Columbia is on that Eastern slope of the Rockies. So as we'll see, we get a lot of typically Eastern species in the Northeastern corner of British Columbia because it's on that East slope of the Rockies. And you also see there's some mountain ranges coming in from up North, up from the Arctic down into Northern BC. And up there, we also get birds that are more characteristic of the Arctic nesting at their Southern breeding extreme in Northern British Columbia. And we'll talk more about this in the coming hour. But before we talk about those, I wanted to share some of these resident birds that are in the region year round, some of these northern boreal forest specialties. And I think there aren't many species more beautiful um, and more intriguing and eye catching than, than the great gray owl. Um, the great gray owl is a absolutely beautiful bird, as you can probably see here. Um, they are found kind of all throughout the boreal forest uh, through Canada, um, but they are particularly uh, common in kind of, I would say Northern BC is where I've seen quite a few of these birds. We do get them all the way into the Southern part of the province, but uh, the boreal forest of Northern Canada, that's their home. Uh, so here's another look at a great gray owl. They're often found kind of along forest edges where you kind of have open areas meeting the edge of the forest. And they, they like to be there uh, because there's open grass, which is where they can hunt for rodents. They have incredible hearing. So uh, they can you know, pinpoint where their prey is and then dive into the grass and pull it up without you, know, you even knowing that there was a little rodent scurrying around there. Um, and this particular owl was sitting on this fence post and it was around dusk and I uh, positioned myself so the owl was silhouetted against the sunset sky and I waited for it to take off and I got really lucky when a few minutes later it flew in my direction, just dove straight down into the grass and I captured this silhouette shot of the great gray owl in flight. But uh, it's not just big birds that call the, uh, the, northern, the northern part of British Columbia home all year round. There's also little birds. Um, and this is one of my favorites of the, of the little guys. This is a boreal chickadee. Um, we have four species of chickadee in BC, black-capped and chestnut-backed being the ones that we're most familiar with here on the south coast. Um, but there's also mountain chickadees throughout the interior. And in northern BC, in many areas, the boreal chickadee is the most common chickadee. So it's nice to kind of change things up, get, a, get some different bird diversity up there. This here is a beautiful bird that we have in Northern BC uh, breeding in the area. So in the summertime, you can find these guys nesting. This is the Bohemian waxwing. Again, we're familiar with the cedar waxwing down here. We do occasionally get Bohemian waxwings, but they're pretty rare. Up in Northern BC, you have both of them nesting and you can at this spot where I took this picture, the Lyard River Hot Springs in Northern BC, you have both Bohemian and cedar waxwings nesting side by side. Um, and the Bohemian waxwing is quite a northern species. So this is kind of in, the, in a relatively southern area for their range. They, they breed all the way much further north. We've also got birds that kind of are found in the high elevation alpine areas and subalpine areas. One of those is the gray crowned rosy finch pictured here. It's actually somewhat unusual to see one in a tree. They're often kind of just on the ground in the tundra among the rocks, but this one perched up on a little tree right on the tree line for a moment. And I captured this photo. And one bird that really makes me think of Northern BC is the white-throated sparrow pictured here. They have this beautiful whistling song. And when I'm up there, I'm doing a lot of camping um, and there's nothing like waking up in the boreal forest and just being serenaded, serenaded by the whistling songs of white-throated sparrows all around you. So this is a bird I really associate with, uh, with Northern BC. So this is another one that you find up there. This is an olive-sided flycatcher. And kind of unlike some of the other birds that we've looked at here, olive-sided flycatchers are migratory. So they're only in the north of the province in the, uh, in the, in the breeding season, in the spring and summer. And uh, they migrate all the way down uh, into, I presume, Central and South America. 
And this one I photographed on a absolutely bucketing rainy day. And the weather is often unpredictable um, up in Northern BC and often it changes really quick. So if you don't like the weather, just wait a few minutes and it might change. <laughs> so there's some birds that really are remarkable to me because they are just found in such a crazy variety of areas and habitats. And one of those is definitely this species here. This is the Wilson snipe. Um, the Wilson snipe, you'll be in a lowland valley, nice and warm with some wetland area and you'll hear and see Wilson snipes. And then you'll be kind of up in a high elevation boreal forest and you'll get Wilson snipes. And then you'll be camping way up in the mountains in the tundra and you'll have a Wilson snipe fly over. They are so versatile uh, in the habitats that they choose. They're of course all the way found down into Southern British Columbia. Um, and uh, it's a really cool bird that we that is quite common around wetland areas in the north of the province. So while the Wilson snipe is a, a widespread breeder, there's some species up in northern BC that are very rare and, uh, and restricted breeding species. And one of those is definitely the Pacific loon. Um, the Pacific loon is generally kind of a very northern breeding species. And the northern uh, part of BC, right on the Yukon border, is pretty much their southern breeding range limit in western Canada. Um, so there's only a few pairs of these birds that have been observed breeding in the province. Very, very small numbers. Um, so I was beyond thrilled to, to uh, encounter this pair of loons on this lake. Again, it was on a very rainy afternoon when this happened, um, as you can see in this picture here. But uh, this year, that year where I photographed them, I think this was maybe 2019, around then, um, they were on a nest with eggs and I saw them just this past summer as well, and they had chicks. So uh, a pair that's clearly been using this lake as their nesting territory for several years and one of very few pairs of Pacific loons nesting in the province of British Columbia. So when it comes to uh, the different strategies that birds use um, in terms of their movement, we've seen birds that are resident, um, like the boreal chickadee. We've seen birds that are migratory, like the olive-sided flycatcher. Then there's birds like these, which are nomadic. Uh, this is the white-winged crossbills, and crossbills and a lot of other finches tend to move around with the availability of food. So there's some years when I've been in Northern BC and this is the most common bird around by far. They are absolutely everywhere and they can be singing and calling so much that it gets hard to hear the other birds. It's not, I'm not really complaining though because they're a, sure a stunning bird as you can see in this picture here. But other years there's none at all. And it kind of just has to do with uh, the availability of food. These are birds that use their, their uh, crossed beak to open up pine cones and extract the seeds from pine cones. So their movements are dependent somewhat on cone crops. And the other type of crossbill that's found in Northern BC, uh, and the only other crossbill in, in, North, uh, in, in British Columbia, is, uh, red, is the red crossbill pictured here, which is a bird we get down here as well. However, this particular red crossbill is, is a very special red crossbill. Um, if you are aware of kind of crossbill, uh, crossbills and crossbill genetics, you might be uh, aware that there are about uh, 10 or 11 different call types of red crossbill that are genetically slightly different, but best differentiated by the sounds that they make. There's several different types of these crossbills in North America. Um, the ones that we tend to see the most kind of on the Southwest coast are the type threes. Um, this bird is a type seven, which has also been nicknamed the enigmatic red crossbill. Um, it's the red crossbill that in North America, the least is known about. Um, and there's very, very few sightings that have been well documented of these birds. Um, and because in order to kind of identify them, you need to hear them call, ideally get a recording of them calling. And even with a photo, the photo doesn't tell us much. You really need to, to get a recording of them calling. But I was exploring this provincial park with my friend Josh, who you can see pictured here. This is Stone Mountain Provincial Park in Northern BC in the Northern Rockies. And this is right on the tree line where I took this photo, but up ahead, you can see that valley full of, uh, of lodgepole pines and subalpine fir and other trees like that. And the type seven red crossbill very much loves lodgepole pines. And as you can see here, uh, it was using its beak to pry open those cones and pull out the seeds. Um, and this was even more exciting because these, uh, this uh, right wing, this, sorry, this type seven red crossbill, the enigmatic red crossbill, had recently fledged young in tow, which were following him around. They were begging for food and he was actively feeding them the seeds that he extracted from the cones. Now, this bird is probably much more widespread than we know. There's just not a lot of bird watchers up in Northern BC, but this was the first uh, confirmed breeding record of the type seven enigmatic red crossbill in British Columbia. And the first known photographs of the type seven crossbill 
in the province. So this was exciting and it warranted a, uh, a research paper in the, the BCFO journal about uh, these types of encrossbills that my friend Josh and I uh, found in, uh, in Northern BC. So that was pretty exciting. But moving on to some of the other birds that that are found in the region. One family of birds and or that really um, that really excites me and that are a lot of fun to look for are the chickens, um, like this ruffed grouse pictured here. Um, and if you go kind of during the like July that sort of time, a lot of the grouse have their chicks, their babies, all over the place. Um, and you'll often see mothers kind of out in the middle of the road, really alert as all their little ones scurry across. And one really neat thing about young grouse and, and other birds in this uh, in this group, these like chicken like birds, is that the young are what we call precocial, which means that they are pretty much fully able to find food um, and look after themselves very quickly after they hatch. In fact, these this little chick here can fly, even though it's probably just a few days old. Um, so they're very impressive, uh, but they do rely on their mother for kind of protection. She's watching for predators. She's guiding them across hazards and, and uh, bringing them to good feeding areas, but they're really remarkable. And here's another uh, chicken-like bird. These ones I, I lovingly refer to as mountain chickens, and this is a ptarmigan. And specifically, this is a rock ptarmigan. Um, we have three species of ptarmigan in BC, uh, the rock ptarmigan, the willow ptarmigan, and the white-tailed ptarmigan. In my opinion, the rock ptarmigan is the hardest one to find of the three. So it was really exciting to find this beautiful bird. Now, ptarmigan are famous and well known because they molt their feathers to match their surroundings throughout the season. So in the wintertime, they're completely white to blend in with the snow. And then by kind of midsummer, they're usually quite brown to, and grayish to blend in with the rocks and the soil and the tundra. But this here was taken kind of in, in June, which is kind of when there's still a little bit of snow up in the Alpine. And, and it's kind of just, even though spring is almost over, it's like spring is just kind of starting up in the Alpine areas in Northern BC. Um, and this rock ptarmigan was in its transition phase where it's molting from its white feathers to its brown feathers. And you'd think this transition phase would be a really good time to try to spot a rock ptarmigan because it's all white or mostly white still in an environment that doesn't have a ton of snow. That's what I thought, and I was wrong. This ptarmigan is in this picture here. Um, see if you can spot it. Kind of go from the center of the image down and to the left a little, and look among the rocks. It's tucked in there, and I'll enlarge it here so you can see it. That's that rock ptarmigan there, hidden in the rock. So it's quite remarkable that this rock ptarmigan seems to know that it blends in really well with these rocks that have splotchy bits of lichen on it, kind of like it has splotchy bits of brown on its feathers. Um, it was remarkable how well this bird camouflaged. So moving on now to some of these eastern birds. I, I mentioned at the beginning of, of the presentation, northeastern British Columbia is on the eastern side of the Rocky Mountains, and the Rocky Mountains act as a large barrier for a lot of migratory bird species, kind of dividing the east and the west. So a lot of the songbirds in northeastern BC are birds that you would expect to see if you went on a birding trip in Ontario except we're still here in the western part of the continent. So it makes it pretty exciting. And one of these beautiful birds that uh, is often singing in the forest in the Peace River region, kind of the Fort St. John area, is this one here. This is the rose-breasted grosbeak, a close relative of the, of the uh, black-headed grosbeak, which we get on the coast. This here is one of the most common birds um, in Northeastern BC. Uh, uh, this is the, the yellow-bellied sapsucker. And if you go once their eggs have hatched and they've young in the nest, you will find nests of these birds everywhere when you're walking through the aspen forests because the young make a lot of noise. So you'll just be walking down and you'll hear baby sapsuckers all over the place. Um, so they're very easy to find, a very common bird, but a very beautiful one. And, and again, a bird that's more typical of Eastern North America. This one here is a bit of a rare species. This is a Baltimore Oriole. Um, again, an Eastern bird that reaches its Western extreme in, in uh, the Peace River region of BC, a beautiful bird but a hard one to find. Um, this is one of the less reliable species. It can take a lot of effort specifically looking for them to find them, but sometimes you just get lucky and you run into, uh, into a couple of them as did, as did I on when I took this photo of one in flight. Uh, but it's a, another, a relative of the Bullock's Oriole here on, on the west part of the uh, province. Some birds are a little more drab, but still subtly beautiful. This is a Leconte Sparrow, another bird only found in, in that part of the province. And of course, there are one of the most attractive birds, I think, for bird watchers visiting the region uh, is the warblers. 
And of the warblers, I've heard a lot of people tell me that they think the most beautiful warbler in BC is the Magnolia warbler. It's hard to disagree with that. They're pretty stunning. This is the male here. Uh, just a spectacular combination of like gray, black, yellow, and white. Um, and especially up in the Northern Rockies, the Magnolia warblers are quite common. But there's a lot of warbler diversity in the north of the province. So let's take a look at some of the other species that are found. This here is the black pole warbler. Um, this one is actually much more common in northwestern BC than it is in northeastern BC, I find, although you can find them in both areas. Unlike most warblers, it's not very colorful, but I do think they look quite beautiful nonetheless, and they have this crazy high-pitched song that, uh, that um, it's just, that it's probably the highest bird song that I've ever heard, um, up there with things like grasshopper sparrows. It's, it's ridiculous. This here is a very sought after bird and a very beautiful one by bird watchers in the, in the region. This is a Canada warbler. And all these warblers that we're looking at, they're tiny, but they have to be very strong. They undergo very, very long migrations from Canada down to South America. So let's take a look at what that migration looks like. This here is a animation produced uh, by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology based on observations made by birders like you and me submitted to eBird. So basically people submitting observations to eBird throughout the year tells them where these Canada warblers are. So this is right now around New Year's, January, December. And you can see all the Canada warblers are down here in South and Central America. And it seems to me like they're particularly hanging out on the slope of the Andes in like Ecuador, Peru, Colombia, that area there. Now in kind of, we're in March, April and May. This is when you can see they're really migrating up. And if I pause it here, You'll notice this is July, August, the very extreme of where these Canada warblers reach is Northeastern BC. They're nesting all across Canada and the very extreme is Northeastern BC. So it's pretty neat that we have these birds nesting in the province. And I guess they're arguably the ones that have migrated the furthest of all the, of, of all the members of this species. And a lot of the warblers in this region follow this similar trend of migrating down to South America and coming up to the boil forest to nest. So let's take a look at some more of these warblers. This is the Tennessee warbler, uh, one of the most common warblers in a lot of habitats. Um, similar uh, to the orange crown warbler in some plumages, although when you get a nice uh, bird like this, they look quite obviously different. This is a, another one that's not too colorful, but still is spectacular. This is the black and white warbler with a very high pitched song as well, but not as high pitched as this one, which is the Cape May warbler. Now the Cape May warbler is quite a rare species in Northeastern BC. Um, again, it's the very limit of its breeding range. They're not even seen very much every year. Some years there's pretty much none and other years they're relatively common. I've been fortunate to see them a few times and they're always just such a spectacular bird to see. And the Cape May warbler along with this one, the bay breasted warbler, which is arguably even rarer than the Cape May warbler are spruce budworm specialists. So there's a, a beetle um, that it's larvae or worms that uh, are associated with spruce trees and they undergo outbreaks. And when these uh, beetle populations have outbreaks, there's a lot of food available for the, for the warblers. And when there's these insect outbreaks like that, that tends to be when we see the Cape May and bay-breasted warblers in the region, both of which are very rare, some of the rarest breeding birds in the province. Uh, but recent years have actually been really good for bay-breasted warblers in particular. I've seen a few of them a few different years, I've in like the last five years, I've seen bay-breasted warblers, which is pretty neat because they are a very rare bird. So we keep talking about these Eastern birds and I've mentioned sometimes, oh, you know, like the Baltimore Oriole is a close relative of the Bullock sort. And there's a lot of close relatives um, that, that of these birds that exist. So let's take a look at some of them. On the right here is the black-throated green warbler. This is an Eastern warbler species found in Northeastern BC. On the left is one we're probably more familiar with, the Townsend's warbler, kind of a Western North American species. However, they do make their way up to the Northern Rocky Mountains. And this is the only place on earth where the Townsend's warbler and the black-throated green warbler might meet on the breeding ground. So with these two very closely related species, you might be wondering, do they ever interbreed? Do they mate with each other and form hybrids? Well, the answer is yes, they do. Um, there are hybrids found in the area. However, um, it's not a lot of hybrids, and it seems that the hybrids themselves don't tend to have very high fitness. They're not mating with a lot of other birds 
Um, and the pure birds don't really want to mate with the, with the hybrids. So even though hybrids get formed, it's a stable hybrid zone. It's not expanding. So these two species aren't merging together. Um, they are good separate species, even though the occasional hybrid does exist. Um, and this is research that is done by uh, Dr. Darren Irwin, who is a professor I've had at, uh, at UBC and his students. And they've looked at a lot of the speciation and genetics that have taken place in uh, Northeastern BC. And we'll look at some more examples shortly. Here's another group of very closely related birds, all of which are found in Northeastern BC. In the top right is the McGillivray's warbler, a bird that we have here in Southwestern British Columbia. And on the top left is the morning warbler, a really closely related species. Again, they do form hybrids, um, but the hybrids are even rarer in this case. Um, so they, once again, they, they are very good separate species, even though they occasionally form hybrids. And in the bottom middle here is the Connecticut warbler, which is a, I don't wanna say they're a very rare breeding bird in British Columbia because they're there every year. It's just one of the hard ones to track down. Um, they're found in very small numbers. So it can take a bit of effort to find them, but they have a remarkable song. It's often described as explosive. It's so loud and you can find them uh, singing away from the dense understory or canopy of, of, of thick aspen forests in Northeastern British Columbia. So the McGillivray's warbler on the top right, the morning warbler on the top left and the Connecticut warbler in the bottom center. So we've looked at birds that are extremely closely related and look very similar. You sometimes get birds that are extremely similar but aren't quite as closely related. So on the left here is the hermit thrush and on the right here is an oven bird. Now these two birds, looking at them here, look very similar. The differences are quite subtle, um, but these are not very closely related. They're in the same order, they're songbirds, but they're in different families. The one on the left, the hermit thrush, is uh, in the same family as robins, turdidae, and the one on the right, the oven bird, is actually in the family of the warblers, parulidae. Um, so very similar looking birds, completely different families. Why does this happen? Um, I, I don't know the details of if, if anyone's looked into this specific uh, case, but usually we would call something like this convergent evolution, where two different species evolve the same characteristics independently because it's something that just works in their environment. There's something about this coloration, which I guess just works. Maybe it gives them good camouflage, um, but whatever it is, they both look extremely similar, but thankfully, they're found in different habitats and they sound very different. So in the field, it's not something that you have to worry about confusing all that often. And sometimes you get birds that look quite different, but they're actually the same species. So this is an example of that here. This is the yellow rumped warbler. On the left is the myrtle yellow rumped warbler, which is a more of an Eastern subspecies. And on the right is the Audubon's yellow rumped warbler, which is more of a Western subspecies. Uh, these birds meet all throughout British Columbia, really. Um, we see quite a few myrtles even here on the coast sometimes, but they interbreed quite a bit, and these are considered one species, even though they look quite different. Here's some other species pairs in northern BC uh, that are closely related. On the left, we've got our provincial bird, the Stellar's jay, and on the right, the blue jay. Um, and northern BC is the only place uh, in the province that we reliably see blue jays, and they're a very beautiful bird. I know a lot of people in like Ontario and much of Eastern North America see blue jays all the time, but someone as someone, uh, you know, growing on the West Coast, of, growing up on the West Coast of British Columbia, I get excited when I see a blue jay. Um, and in Northern BC, you can see both these species. Now, this is a really neat interaction. Um, I'm actually going to just stop sharing and reshare for a moment so I can enable the sound, um, which I forgot to do. Share sound. Here we go. Just one moment, I have to uh, re-open this presentation. But uh, we're gonna be looking at the Pacific Wren and the Winter Wren, which if you've been you know, interested in birds and birding for uh, long enough, you'll probably remember a time just about 10, 12 years ago when these were all, these were all Winter Wrens. There was no such thing as the uh, Pacific Wren. Um, and research was done and they determined that these two species are actually separate, okay. Here we go. So on the left is the winter wren, on the right, the Pacific wren, they look pretty much identical. However, they sound different. So I'm gonna play the Pacific wren song here um, and uh, you'll see, whoops. Oh, here we go, here we go. Listen closely. So 
that's the song of the Pacific Wren, um, something that you're probably familiar with. Now let's listen to the song of the Winter Wren. It's very similar, but uh, listen closely and see if you can hear just general qualities that make it different. So at a first listen, these two uh, birds probably sound really similar, but when you listen to them enough, um, they actually start to sound quite different. The Pacific Wren is a little higher pitched, a little more mechanical, and, and I find it's a little more shrill. I find the Winter Wren a little more uh, nicer sounding, a little more melodic, um, but both these birds, meet in uh, northeastern British Columbia. Specifically, uh, they, there's a town called Tumbler Ridge. And Tumbler Ridge is the place where one of my professors at UBC, Darren Irwin, did research on these birds. Notice that there's birds that sing one song, the Pacific Wren song. There's birds that sing another song, the Winter Wren song. And upon doing genetic analysis of these birds found that they completely don't breed with each other. It's extremely rare of like 100 or 200 cases, they only found like one or two birds that seem to have intermediate genetics. So these birds look the same to our eyes, but they can tell the difference between each other, probably mostly using that song. Um, so this is a really neat thing that we have in Northeastern BC in a case where a bird that used to be considered one species was researched with the latest genetic technology and it was decided that the winter end would be split and we now have the winter wren and the pacific wren both occurring in northeastern british columbia so we've looked at a lot of the incredible birds that um, exist in the northern part of the province but i wanted to talk a little bit about some of the threats that this part of uh, the province face this here is a place called watson slough it's a beautiful sedge marsh as you can see from the photo and Watson Slough and other sedge marshes in the area are the home of the yellow rail, which is a, a very rare species, a very hard species to find. And it's a species considered to be of special concern in Canada. Um, and this, unfortunately, is a place that is not going to have yellow rails for much longer because this particular valley here is going to be flooded upon the completion of the Site C Dam project, which I'm sure you've heard about, a very large energy project in Northern British Columbia, um, which is you know, not, a, not emitting carbon, it's a renewable project. However, it's also considered to have uh, one of the largest environmental tolls of a, of a project of its kind in Canadian history. I mean, it's gonna have devastating impacts on this particular ecosystem, removing a lot of the remaining habitat of the yellow rail. Um, so that's not good news for a lot of the birds that, uh, and other rare wildlife species that are existing in this valley. Um, but as if that wasn't enough, there's more than just kind of, you know, industry and development projects and energy projects going on. When I visited this region this past summer, we couldn't find yellow rails. It wasn't because this had been flooded. It's going to be flooded soon, but it hasn't been flooded quite yet. It was because it was extremely dry. Um, there was drought, it was, I'm sure you remember the heat wave, it was really hot, and this marsh was just really dry. And no one that I've spoken to, no one that I know of, saw a yellow rail or heard a yellow rail in the province of British Columbia this past summer. And I wouldn't be surprised if it's because of how dry it was. We looked in multiple different sedge marshes and all of them were really dry, so not great habitat for the yellow rail. So in addition to, uh, you know, destruction of habitat, climate change, is having an impact in Northern British Columbia. And, uh, you know, forest fires are definitely a part of that. This was a fire near Bucking Horse River in Northeastern British Columbia that I ran into with a friend uh, this past summer. Uh, we had been birding, we were driving north from Fort St. John to Fort Nelson, um, and we had a few storms pass through, which had a lot of lightning, but not a lot of rain and precipitation. And sure enough, as we continued north, we started spotting smoke on the horizon. Um, and as we continued up the highway, we spotted the flames, as you can see in this picture here, um, cresting a hill in the distance. The cell reception wasn't very good, so we couldn't, we couldn't really call in the fire to report it quite yet. But uh, as soon as we got into cell range, we, we called it in and it had been already been reported earlier that day by some other people who uh, had seen it earlier. But um, it was, you know, seeing a forest fire like this and seeing all the smoke in the air, is pretty devastating. 
Now, we should talk more about this because forest fire does have a important ecological role. Um, there's no denying that like when you're walking through a forest like this that has been recently burnt and it's just the skeleton of the trees, it's pretty eerily quiet and is a scene of mass destruction um, with very few birds and animals around immediately after the flames. But it doesn't take long for uh, succession to begin and for the plants to begin to regenerate, as you can see in this picture here. However, with uh, a lot of issues, some of which climate change related, with uh, droughts becoming more frequent and more extreme, um, as well as things like mismanagement of forests uh, in recent years, like not allowing them to burn at all, um, has made fires get worse in recent years, as has been extremely obvious in the province of British Columbia. So this is a combination of factors. Climate change is definitely one of them. And it can be pretty devastating to see the extent of some of these burnt forests. Um, this here is uh, pretty much as far as you can see to the horizon in all directions was burnt forest. This is a photo I took with a drone. I sent the drone up to kind of just see how extensive it was. And it was very extensive. However, like I said, forest fires have an important ecological role. There's a lot of birds that rely on, on burnt forests uh, as habitat. There's even trees and plants that rely on fire for them to drop their seeds. But this exists in a very delicate balance and having too much fire can be a problem. But I did want to highlight a species that very much benefits from forest fires. And that's this one here. This is the black-backed woodpecker. Um, the black-backed woodpecker is a bird that you almost exclusively find around burns, basically forests that has been burned uh, several years in the past. Um, the bark in these forests is dead, um, and I guess they can very easily kind of chip away that dead bark and get at the insects living inside. Um, so it's uh, a bird that relies on forest fires. They're not exclusively found in burned areas, but it's where you tend to find them the most. If you want to find a black-backed woodpecker, go to some forest that was burned like five, ten years ago, and that's where you're going to find them. And when I look at a black bag woodpecker and I see that solid black back, I wonder, maybe that's an adaptation to, uh, to camouflage in with burnt trees. It wouldn't surprise me. Again, I don't know if anyone's looked into that, but um, they sure can camouflage quite well on burnt trees. This particular tree wasn't burnt anytime recently. It's got its bark color there, but, uh, but they are a, a neat bird that relies on forest fires. But kind of coming back to the topic of habitat loss, logging is a, a big part of the, uh, economy in Northern British Columbia. Um, there is a lot of logging going on. And as someone who grows up not in a place that sees a lot of logging, like living in the city, you don't see piles of logs over the place. Again, it's a pretty devastating sight for, for someone like me to see a scene like this. I took a picture of my friend Ian here in front of this massive uh, wall of logs, which just went on and on and on again, like feels like as far as the eye can see. Um, and although obviously forestry is a very important part of our lives, um, we all use wood. Um, it's being done in a way in Northern British Columbia that is considered by most, uh, by, by many to not be very sustainable. Um, and one of the species we're seeing that uh, kind of play a role on and we're, a species we're seeing being impacted by this quite a bit is the caribou. So caribou, um, as you may have heard, are generally species that have, is a species that has declined quite a bit in Canada. Um, and it's interesting because some animals like deer and moose um, have increased and the caribou has not, they've generally decreased. So why is this? Well, this caribou I photographed up in the alpine above the tree line, but caribou spend a lot of the year down in the trees and they like mature forests. They eat things like lichens, which tend to grow in these mature forests and they rely on this intact mature forest uh, for their habitat and for their food, and they don't do as well in fragmented habitats. Now, as a result of the decline in caribou, the BC government is spending a lot of money, um, a couple million dollars in the winter of 2019-2020, trying to kill wolves. And wolves are, of course, a natural predator of caribou. Um, they, they've been consuming them for, for a very, very long time, but what, what has happened with forestry practices that I consider unsustainable are a few things. The, the fragmentation of forests has made it a lot easier for wolves to get into areas where caribou are. Um, so the wolves have uh, an easier time accessing their prey. Additionally, as I said, moose have actually increased because moose like to forage in clear cuts. They do very well on that new vegetation growth. So when the forests are logged and in a way that supports moose populations, there's more moose. So now the wolves have a very abundant food source in the form of the moose, 
So the wolf population might increase a little bit, but then because the logging is still going on, the wolves then who have slightly elevated numbers can then more easily get into the habitat of caribou. And then the effect of the caribou become, uh, from the predation on the wolves on the caribou becomes worse. Now, moose are incredible species, caribou are incredible species, and I don't wanna see either of these species disappear anytime soon. But in my opinion, killing a predator like a wolf um, to try to save the caribou is not a great idea. And in my opinion, it's just something that breaks my heart, especially when you've got forestry practice, practices going on that are the root cause of all these issues that are, that are creating these problems in the forest first place. And until those forestry problems are addressed, it's gonna be very difficult to see recovery in the caribou. But anyways, I've been on a bit of a rant here talking about this interaction between the wolves and the caribou. I do, uh, so I do wanna move on and feature some of the other amazing wildlife species that are encountered in the area. Um, caribou are one that I've actually seen on several trips to the region, despite being uh, declining and being rare. I've seen caribou several times um, in Northern British Columbia, uh, more times than I haven't actually. So they're, they're pretty reliable. But one species that I've pretty much never missed in Northern British Columbia is this one here. This is the stone sheep, uh, which is a subspecies of the dull sheep, which is a close relative of the bighorn sheep, which we get in the interior in uh, Southern British Columbia and in the, the the Rocky Mountains kind of on the border with Alberta. But almost the entire proportion of the world's population of stone sheep live in the province of British Columbia. And uh, they're just really fun to watch. This one here photographed up kind of near the tree line in the Alpine. And this one here resting at the top of a cliff on a, on a rainy day. Um, so it's a fun, a fun animal to, to observe and photograph. And here's one I photographed on the top of a ridge in the Alpine on a really stormy day. This is actually the same day that I took the photo of the forest fire. Um, so this was some of those storm systems passing through that had a lot of lightning that caused that forest fire. Um, that's what you see in the background of this picture here of this beautiful ram uh, at the top of this ridge. And I put this photo in black and white just to kind of highlight the textures in the clouds and, and the, just the beautiful tones in this scene. I found it works really nicely in black and white. Another animal that we see in Northern BC and one that's a little bit of a conservation success story in some sense is the wood bison. This is the largest land mammal in, on the entire continent. There's nothing bigger than it than lives on, that lives on land in North America. Um, and wood bison were actually hunted to extinction. As I'm sure you're aware, bison used to be in the, present in the millions across kind of the plains and prairies of North America. And with the arrival of uh, European settlers, they wiped them out very quickly. Um, and the last bi wild wood bison in BC was killed in 1906. However, um, in the late 1900s, they reintroduced small numbers of bison back to northeastern British Columbia. And there are now once again a few hundred uh, bison roaming the area, which is nothing close to the historical numbers. But it is nice that we have a species that was formerly not, that was hunted to local extinction, once again present in the area. And they are incredible animals to watch. And one of the easiest ones to find because they love to forage on the grass right next to the roadways, because uh, it's just open fields, it's a great food source for them to be eating. You can see here a, 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 a adult with a calf there. Um, and you often see a lot of calves, these, these smaller, more brownish, reddish colored ones. And this photo here I took on a really rainy day, again, put it on black and white just to kind of accentuate that gloomy mood that came with the atmosphere. And the bison do what they want. Uh, and what I mean by that is sometimes they just kind of park themselves in the middle of the road and block the traffic. And it's a lot of fun in my opinion, just kind of watch them. Although obviously uh, vehicle collisions are an issue. So it's important to drive carefully, especially if you're out at night. But um, this here is a bison that just crossed the road and I rolled down my window. And this is a cropped photo with a telephoto lens, but it's quite something to see an animal this close up that is this large. And just look at those details in that fur. It's quite a remarkable creature. And one really neat interaction I saw once with a, a group of bison was between this black bear that you see here and the herd of bison. Um, this uh, black bear was kind of walking down the margin of the road. The herd of bison was all um, you know, hunkered down in the grass. And as the black bear approached the group of bison, and they all started standing up one by one, 
Um, and the black bear was walking with them towards them with a lot of intent. Um, I do not think there's a world where a black bear takes out a bison, although I'm sure they'd scavenge on like a, a carcass or maybe if there was like a really sick dying one or something, they might try to eat it. But, but black bear is really up there. You just mostly see them eating grass. And as soon as these uh, bison stood up, this was kind of the last moment before the bear turned around and ran away really quickly, which was probably a good move. <laughs> but speaking of bears, there's a lot of black bears up in Northern BC. I've seen as many as 25 in a day and that's happened many times. Um, so it's one of the most common mammals that you see. Um, and you know, black bears and, and these wildlife predators in general often get a, a nasty reputation. Um, but the reality is bears and wolves especially, which is, are the ones that are being killed to, in a kind of desperate attempt to try to save caribou are really important in the ecosystem. Um, they regulate prey populations, which when you, if you have too many, too many, you know, grazers, your vegetation growth gets stunted and then that changes the habitat available to things like birds. So having, you know, healthy predator populations in an ecosystem is really important. Um, and black bears aren't really the biggest predators. They're omnivorous and they honestly just, I mostly see them eating plants. But um, I do think that they often get a bad reputation. And from my experience, if you treat them with respect, you know, you keep an appropriate distance away from them. When I'm photographing them, I'm limiting the time I'm spending with them and I'm using a telephoto lens from far away. Um, you are just being smart in bear country. You're not leaving food out. Uh, you know, you're hiking around with bear spray. If you do these things to respect these animals. I really think there's a world where it's very easy to coexist with them. And, you know, having seen hundreds upon hundreds of bears now in Northern BC, I'm happy to report I've never had even one encounter I'd consider negative where there was any kind of indication of aggression or conflict whatsoever. Um, so these are, you know, amazing animals and a, a pretty common sight in the north part of the province. A little bit rarer than the black bears are grizzly bears, um, but I have seen grizzly bears a few times up there. And this here was a really precious moment as this uh, mother bear crossed a highway um, with her three cubs. And, you know, a lot of the time, you know, in the science world, a lot of people try not to put emotions onto animals. But when you see, when I see something like this and I see the expressions on the face of the cubs and the way they're acting, uh, it's hard not to believe that there's curiosity and fascination going on here. Um, and I do think these, these animals convey quite a bit of emotion from the, from the time I've spent uh, watching them. But I wanted to move on now to an area of Northern British Columbia called the Haynes Triangle. The Haynes Triangle is an absolutely stunning place. Um, it, in my opinion, probably the most beautiful place I've ever been to. Um, I think it really is a close rival of places like the Canadian Rockies, like Banff and Jasper National Park. I think it's just as beautiful and then there's no one there. So you have it all to yourself. So this is a spectacular place. And the Haynes Triangle of all the places in Northern BC is kind of what I consider to be my favorite place on earth. Like the Haynes Triangle itself, that's my favorite spot. So where is the Haynes Triangle? Well, if you look on this map in the top left corner, right up there is Tachinchini Alsek Provincial Park, which is the main kind of protected area in that region. That's the Haynes Triangle. It's a little corner of BC that is sandwiched between the Yukon and Southeast Alaska. And the only way to actually access it by land is through the Yukon. So if you wanna bird the Haynes Triangle, you have to go up to Whitehorse and you can spend some time in the Southern Yukon and then head in to, to uh, the Haynes Triangle. The mountain range here is the St. Elias Mountains, which is the same mountain range that Mount Logan, the tallest mountain in Canada is in. So this is the, the tallest mountain range in the country. Um, and you just have so many spectacular glaciers and incredible peaks like you see here. And uh, just a, uh, another photo here showcasing the beauty of the area. This is Three Guardsmen Mountain. And I was hiking with my friend Josh here up in the tundra. And I saw this little hill with three guardsmen poking out of the clouds up ahead. And I was like, Josh, do you mind running up and standing on that rock? And uh, thankfully he obliged. And I, I captured this photo of him up standing on this rock in front of three guardsmen. Just a beautiful place. But uh, what makes the Haynes Triangle so special in my opinion is not just the scenery, but really the birds that nest there are really, really special. Because there's a lot of birds there that are more typical nesters in the Arctic. They're like kind of Northern Canada, Arctic breeding birds that reach a more Southern end of their breeding range in the Haynes Triangle. It's an ecosystem that despite being far away from the Arctic resembles the Arctic in a lot of ways. So one of the more common shorebirds that nests up in the tundra is the one pictured here on kind of the right of the frame. And here's another look at it. This is the semi-palmated plover. 
a bird that I'm used to seeing migrating through here on the mud flats uh, and on the coast. You know, you're used to seeing them by the, the ocean. So to see them in the mountains is really, really special, in my opinion. They are remarkable birds. And here's another close up of the semi palmated plover. They're beautiful birds, too. Uh, when we see them migrating through here, sometimes you see them in breeding plumage, but not always. So it's really neat to be up there where they're all in their beautiful breeding colors. And like I said, it's one of the more common shorebirds that nests in the area. Now on the rock here is one of the less common shorebirds that nests in the area. This is the wandering tattler. Um, and the wandering tattler, you often find them around kind of riverbeds and areas where you've got these big rocks and boulders lying around up in the tundra, sometimes along the edge of lakes as well. And the wandering tattler is, at its southern breeding extreme in the Haynes Triangle. So they've never been found nesting anywhere further south than the Haynes Triangle. They can sometimes be a little tricky to find, uh, but they are worth the effort because I think they just look really cool. Um, and to see a bird that you know, like it's just a, at its southern extreme, there's something to be really cool about seeing a bird that you'd otherwise have to travel way further north to see. And also something that's neat about the tattlers is here's a map of the world just for a reference. They are really birds that like to vacation in the South Pacific. So the wandering tattlers migrate down to South Pacific tropical islands, French Polynesia, some of them probably going all the way down into Australia, Indonesia, Hawaii. Uh, so this is a bird that spends part of the year on beautiful white sand beaches and part of the year up in the tundra in the Haines Triangle. So one of my favorite birds in the region for sure. And here's a close up shot of one stretching its wings, um, which is something that they often do after they preen themselves, they kind of stretch their wings and get back to foraging in the, in the tundra and along the riverbeds. On the theme of shorebirds, continuing on here with that, uh, this is a lesser yellow legs, uh, which is one that you find less up in the high alpine and more kind of in the valleys, in the wetlands in the area, um, where there's kind of a little bit of more vegetation, a little more grass, a little more cover. That's where you find the lesser yellow legs. And that same habitat, is also the habitat of the trumpeter swan, another bird that we see down here in the wintertime that nests in the Haines Triangle. And often all the kind of medium to large lakes you'll see dotted with a couple white specks in the distance. And each speck is a swan. So there's pairs of trumpeter swans on almost all of kind of the large lakes in the area. And they're really beautiful. Another bird that you see in that habitat is the short-eared owl. Um, again, as a bird I'm used to seeing in kind of coastal salt marshes in the winter time here, it's really neat to be up in the mountains and have short-eared owls flying around. Um, it's just, there's something really special about that. And this bird here that you see on the top of the tree is a whimbrel. Um, and the whimbrel, another very migratory shorebird species, um, this is a special bird because this bird here is the, was represented the first breeding record for the province of British Columbia. So these birds were discovered by Sid Cannings a few years ago. And prior to his discovery of a couple pairs with nests and eggs, there had never been a recorded, a recorded sighting of this species nesting in the province of British Columbia. They tend to nest much further north up towards the Arctic. So to find whimbrels nesting in BC is really, really special. And also something really neat to me is seeing a bird that I'm used to seeing on the beach sitting at the top of a tree. It's just really different and cool. But these whimbrels, uh, one sign that you know a bird is breeding up there is that they don't like you. Understandably, when you are walking into their territory, um, they're very territorial. And often the whimbrels find you before you find the whimbrels. So when they see you coming, they fly in right towards you and land down, um, you know, trying to distract you from their nest, from their young, and making sure that if you're a potential predator, you're not gonna go after their family. Uh, so because of that, it's important not to spend too much time close to them because, you know, this is a, a bird that is almost not found as a breeding species in the province at all. So don't want to put unnecessary stress on these few pairs that nest in the province. Um, but one interesting thing has happened uh, a couple times when I've gone to visit these whimbrels. Uh, both times that I've seen these whimbrels on their nesting territory, they got distracted. Um, and instead of coming in to chase me away, the first time they spotted this moose <laughs> and they instantly left me and my friend and they flew right in towards these moose to chase the moose out of their territory. Um, moose are one of the more common animals up in the Haines Triangle. I've seen a, a few of them around there. 
Um, but this is the only like big bull adult male moose that I've ever seen in that area. Um, actually, it's probably the only like big bull moose I've seen period. I've seen some smaller ones, but uh, this, this moose had a very impressive uh, set of antlers on his head. And we actually heard him before we saw him. Uh, the foliage is pretty tall. So you always got to be aware that there, you know, there could be moose, there could be bears around. Um, and we heard him, you know, crashing through the shrubs and he was a good, I would say like 400 meters away here. Um, but we kind of went up to a little high point and looked ahead and saw the moose there and the wimbrels going right in to escort this moose out of its territory. And the other time I went into this area that has the nesting wimbrels, we spotted these guys, uh, these grizzly bears. Now this encounter was uh, kind of what I consider a perfect encounter with a grizzly bear. You're on foot through the shrubs. Uh, you don't want to surprise a grizzly bear. Again, not because I think they're out to get you or anything, but because they need to be respected and you don't want to spook one. Um, and this case, thankfully, we were walking through and we kind of spotted them, just kind of these blobs up in the grass, maybe about 100 meters up ahead. And it was these two young bears, uh, probably recently left mom, and they were kind of playing, play fighting around in the, in the grass. And suddenly, just a, a few seconds after we spotted them, a gust of wind blew from us towards these bears. And they instantly looked up and, and they stood up on their hind legs and were looking towards us. Now, bears don't have great eyesight, so I don't think they really saw us, but they could definitely smell us. And they stood for a couple seconds, turned around and ran off in the opposite direction, which is exactly what you want. Uh, it's nice to see these bears have, you know, their healthy natural fear of people and they don't want anything to do with you. They're not confronting you. They're just bears being bears in their environment. And here's a few other mammals in the area. Uh, the red fox is one that I've seen a few times there. This one was walking down with a mouthful of birds in its mouth. Uh, this to me looks like maybe some baby thrushes, like maybe a, a great cheek thrush nest or a robin nest or something like that. Um, hard to tell though, it could be many things. Um, and when you see them carrying food like this, you can be sure there's babies nearby. Um, and uh, this area does have quite a few fox dens. So if you feel bad for the nestlings, fair enough, but you can also feel bad for this little cute guy if, uh, if this, this kit doesn't get food to eat. Uh, so that's another animal that's in the area. And one species that I've seen there once is the Canada lynx pictured here. Lynx are really neat uh, because they, they undergo population cycles. So there's times when there's a lot of lynx and there's times when there's not a lot of lynx. And these population fluctuations are driven by the availability of food, uh, like primarily snowshoe hares pictured here. So when there's a lot of hares, the lynx population increases to a maximum. And now all of a sudden, because there's so many lynx around, the snowshoe hares have a lot of predators trying to eat them. So the snowshoe hare population will drop until it becomes very low. But now there's not a lot of food for the lynxes. So the population of the lynx drops. But now without the predators, the snowshoe hare population can once again increase. And then the lynx population follows. Uh, so this cycle has gone on over and over and over again. And, and there's, uh, you know, it's, I think about maybe an eight to 11 year cycle or so of uh, snowshoe hare and lynx populations fluctuating with each other. And it's just a really neat ongoing interaction that occurs. Here's another photo of, uh, of that lynx. They have really big paws, which they use like snowshoes to walk around in the snow in the winter time. And uh, here's that photo I just put in black and white. I found the lynx stood out beautifully in the forest in this black and white. There was a little bit of an opening above it. So this light was shining down onto the lynx and it made for a beautiful scene. Now, I showed you some ptarmigan before, but the ptarmigan that's the most common in the Haynes Triangle by far is the willow ptarmigan. And you'll see one tucked in under a bush on the left side of the screen here. The males have this beautiful reddish color. The females like this one are a beautiful kind of like striped brown, black, white plumage, um, which they camouflage much better than the males. Um, however, sometimes you find one in some green grass like this and they actually do stand out quite a bit. But check out those stunning eye combs, that red eye comb that the male is, has on display here. It's really beautiful. And the Haynes Triangle is definitely the easiest place in the province to find a willow ptarmigan. And one of the, probably the easiest place to find a ptarmigan period that I've ever been to. If you've looked for ptarmigan before, you've probably hiked way up into the Alpine, gone really sore muscles and gone through all that to try to find a ptarmigan. Well, in the Haynes Triangle, because the road is going right through the Alpine, you can see ptarmigans from your car if you try hard enough. So, so it's, a, it's a really neat place to try to track down these birds. 
this one here uh, was actually photographed in Northwestern BC, uh, but I wanted to throw it in here to show that sometimes you do get a ptarmigan that stands out. This one standing in the snow here uh, on full display. But all three ptarmigan species are found up in the Haines Triangle, including the rock ptarmigan pictured here. Uh, I've only found them once, but they are indeed there. Um, and uh, it's just another, another bird you can keep your eyes out for in the region. So this is a really beautiful area. And there's something about visiting this place and having no one around you. It's just you and the wildlife and the birds and the spectacular scenery that makes it really special. And even the birds that are common, like these mugulls I find in this environment, in their breeding colors, look really spectacular. And I called them mugulls that actually were split. So they're, they're renamed now to a uh, short-billed gull. But these short-billed gulls, I mean, this is so much more beautiful than they look when we see them down here on the coast. Uh, so it's, a, it's one of the more common nesting birds around waterways, but they're stunning. And a close relative of the uh, short-billed gull uh, is the Arctic tern pictured here. And the Arctic tern is my favorite bird in the world. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with the Arctic tern, this is a bird that nests up in the north, a lot of them way up in the Arctic, some of them down in places like the Haines Triangle. Um, and when they're done nesting for the season, they migrate over the open oceans all the way to Antarctica. So they literally couldn't go any further. And this is the longest migration of any animal on the planet that's ever been recorded. Scientists have put uh, tracking devices onto these birds and found that they sometimes clock in at 90,000 kilometers in a single year. So I have some facts written down here. Um, in its lifetime, an Arctic tern will migrate almost two and a half million kilometers if it lives a full life, uh, which is equal to traveling the circumference of the earth 60 times or traveling to the moon and back over three times. So this is a remarkable bird. They live 30 years. Um, they often mate for life. Uh, they, they, do, they do tend to pair up with the same birds. And they often return to the exact same nesting spots year after year. Uh, they'll, they'll return to the same colony or the same lake where they nested the year before. Now up in the Haines Triangle, you find these birds sometimes nesting up on kind of high elevation, way up in the tundra, little ponds. They'll, I find they don't nest in colonies up there. I, it's usually just one pair per pond and they're very territorial even to other terns, but especially to things like mugulls and other things that are around them and definitely towards people. Uh, if you come anywhere near a pond where these birds are nesting, they'll come and they'll fly right over top of you and, uh, and escort you out of their territory. But uh, you know, having visited this place a few times, I've, I've been to a pond one year, returned a couple years later and seen Arctic terns there again. And it's just incredible to think that those are probably the same birds that I saw a couple years earlier after they've flown to, to Antarctica, Antarctica and back a few times. So it's just an incredible thing to think about. And here's one last photo of an Arctic tern, uh, just in its stunning tundra environment that you find up in the Haines Triangle. So in addition to these larger birds, I did wanna just in the conclusion of this presentation, highlight some of the smaller birds that you find in the area, like the American pipit, the horned lark, like this one, this is a special one, the great cheeked thrush, uh, definitely the easiest and only, I would say, easy place in all of British Columbia to try to find this bird. And sometimes really bizarre things happen. There was one year that this northern mockingbird showed up right where we were camping. It had been found a few weeks earlier by Sid Cannings, um, and I was camping there a few weeks after him. And this mockingbird, a bird that's normally down in like Oregon, California, was singing away in the subalpine, and it was mimicking things like semi-palmated plovers and willow ptarmigan. So it has clearly been there a while and picks up the local bird sounds and just sometimes really weird things happen. Some of the more common little birds that you find are, are species like the American tree sparrow pictured here and the golden crown sparrow pictured here. But there's one little bird that I've looked for quite a bit in the Haines Triangle and I've yet to find, but they have been seen there before. And that is the Smith's longspur. And this is the only picture of a bird today that wasn't taken by me because I haven't seen this bird. And the story of the Smith's longspur is that this bird was known to breed in the Haines Triangle for quite a while. They were first seen there kind of in the early 1900s and they were confirmed to be breeding later in the 1900s. And for a while, it was a reliable bird. Bird watchers could go to the Haines Triangle and find Smith's longspurs, especially around the Kelso Lake area 
nesting in the subalpine. But what has happened is there's been reduced snowpack in this area as a result of climate change, which means that the grasses and the plants are exposed to sunlight for a lot longer. So the habitat where these birds nest has completely changed. Where the grasses used to be just like a foot or two tall, they're now taller than me, especially these willow shrubs. So the habitat has completely changed. And where there used to be suitable habitat for the Smith's longspur, there's no longer suitable habitat for them. However, um, it's possible there's still suitable habitat, maybe higher elevation. Maybe with climate change, this habitat has just moved to a higher elevation. So this is a mystery. If there is suitable habitat present and it, it doesn't have Smith's longspurs, then maybe they just disappeared you know, by random processes. But if there is no suitable habitat remaining, um, then this could be a bird species that has been lost from the province of British Columbia due to climate change. But nonetheless, uh, I am going to be looking for this bird. I, I want to keep visiting the Haynes Triangle, keep hiking around, visiting higher elevation areas to see if the Smith's longspur still clings on somewhere in the area. But with that, I want to say uh, one more thing, which is that I'm looking at planning some trips, some tours up in Northern British Columbia. So if you're interested in coming to Northern British Columbia on some kind of bird watching or wildlife trip, I've put a link to a form in the chat um, which is basically just a survey if you're at all interested and you want to get updates on any kind of tours that I'm running up in northern BC, you can fill out this survey and it'll basically just ask you things like, um, you know, what region of the province are you most interested in? Do you like all around wildlife? Are you focused on birds? Do you like photography? Just so I can get a sense of, you know, what, what people are interested in, that sort of thing. So the link's in the chat. Um, but with that, I... I would like to say thank you so much for watching the presentation. I've talked at you for a very long time, so I really appreciate uh, your attention and, uh, and I hope you enjoyed the photos and learned some of the things that make the Northern part of British Columbia my favorite place on earth. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing. And if anyone has any questions or anything, I'd be more than happy to answer. <laughs> Great, wonderful, incredible. Incredible, beautiful Thank you. photography. Yeah, that was amazing. Uh, there were a couple of um, questions in in the in the chat. I see those. Perfect. Okay, um, and I don't know if you can answer the one about. Um, I was going to say the first one about the Bohemian and and yeah. the cedar waxwing, but so uh, yeah. So as far as I'm aware, there's been no interbreeding at all between hybridization between Bohemian and Cedar Waxwings. I'd love to be proved wrong because that would look really cool, but I've certainly never heard of a hybrid ever. Um, they, they actually look quite different. And one noticeable different when you see, difference when you see them together is their size. The Bohemian Waxwing is actually uh, quite a bit of a chunkier bird than the Cedar Waxwing. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that's something that maybe influences them uh, to not, not hybridizing. Jane says, when I say something's incredible, what do I mean? I use the word incredible a lot. If anyone's keeping an incredible counter, I mean, it's got to be in the dozens or hundreds. Um, I just mean, I don't know. I mean, it's something that fascinates me. It's something that's amazing. It's something that's beautiful. Uh, but if, there, if there's one word I'd use to describe Northern BC, I'd say incredible. <laughs> uh, Vanessa says, that's exactly what you said when you were there last summer, like the Rockies, but without all the people. Yeah. So the Haynes Triangle is is... It's incredible. I'm, I'm still saying it. <laughs> no people and some of the most spectacular scenery on earth. Sorry, if I can just jump in there. Were we incredibly lucky to see caribou then? We were driving down from uh, like through the Muncho Lake area and it was very foggy sort of at the top of the hill and we saw a few caribou just by the side of the road and, and by the that's sounds of where, things. Yeah, that's where I usually see them. Um, yeah. That's like, it seems like they're obviously they've declined a lot and they're a rare species, but the Muncho Lake area and Stone Mountain area, like yeah. that's where I've seen caribou like three or four times now. So I think uh, they, that there's clearly a herd that is living in that area. And I just, I just wanted to share too. I had a chuckle when you were talking about the bison because we were astonished. They were just plodding down the shoulder of the highway and the <laughs> massive big transport trucks are just barreling down on them and they don't even flinch. Yeah. It was incredible. Yeah. I've seen mothers uh, uh, feeding their calves, like the calves uh, drinking milk from their moms in the middle of the highway. Oh my goodness. Just like wow. standing in the middle of the highway. 
Thankfully, no. it's not the most heavily trafficked highway and it's very wide, but there certainly is some truck traffic there. But uh, yeah, they, they just do what they wish. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so yeah. much. I have a question about the wimbrel. What do they actually eat with those long beaks? They, they look like shorebirds, but what would they get up there? In the, in... Yeah, so so they are shorebirds. Um, I don't know like specifically what they're eating, but I would say almost certainly just little um, like invertebrates, like bugs and stuff in the uh, that are buried in the grasses and the tundra and in the wetlands. On the coast here, they use those beaks to probe into the mud flats, and they're getting invertebrates here. I'm I'm sure they're kind of going for like maybe biofilm, like microscopic stuff as well in the mud. But um, up there, I'd imagine they're just probing for insects and tiny invertebrates as well. But great question. Crystal's asking if I have an Instagram page. I'll type my Instagram handle into the chat. Um, and if you are on social media, Instagram is where I, and as Facebook as well. Um, if, you, if you search for Leron Gertzman Photography on Facebook, you'll be find it as well. Social media is where I post updates and photos almost every day. Um, so if you're interested in following the latest work, latest adventures, all that sort of thing, uh, Instagram or Facebook is the place to do that. <laughs> and I'll just put the, the link to the form in the chat one more time here, it, it, just because it's a, it's a bit far up now, if anyone is, is interested in, in visiting some of these places. I wish I was 20 years younger. Mm, yeah. So the Haynes Triangle, um, to drive from here, are you looking at two or three days? So if you went nonstop, I think like the time that it would take to drive is probably close to 40 hours. Okay. It's about 36 hours to Whitehorse. Uh, so it's maybe a few hours past Whitehorse. Um, but from, from Whitehorse, it's only a few hours. So it's a very, it's a very easy thing to do from Whitehorse. Um, but it, it's, it's worth the trip. I mean, I, when I go up there, I like to take time going up there. There's so much to see along the way. Like it's been at least a week driving up there and at least a week there and at least a week coming down. Uh, but uh, it's, it's worth the trip. It's an amazing area. Okay, any other questions? I, I'm fortunate enough to have one of his, one of his <laughs> prints over. If you look over my shoulder, that's where oh, wow. <laughs> he, may, he may recognize that. Yeah, a city of sheer water taking your triangle water. island. <laughs> One of my prized possessions. <laughs> wow. Thanks, Larry. <laughs> okay, if there aren't any questions, um, maybe we'll go on to Brian and we'll do uh, wildlife sightings. And we just um, say sorry. once oh. again, thank you so much, Liam. That was absolutely incredible. Really yeah, wonderful. Just great beautiful, photography. And... Yeah, beautiful, beautiful presentation. Or Thanks Victoria. So much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think we're all still kind of stunned by what it's we're incredible. Just, just seeing Liron, it's yeah, absolutely. You know, exquisite, uh, 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 incredible. Yeah, I don't know. There's just no words. You know what? I, there are many, many things to love about your presentation, but one of the things I really love and what I really needed tonight was your enthusiasm. <laughs> and I just can't tell you what you've done for my spirits tonight, and I'm sure everybody else. Like, we're looking forward to the spring and the summer, and getting out and being in nature. So, oh, it makes me very happy to hear. <laughs> transformed the week for me. Oh, so thank you so much. Thank you. So yeah, thanks very much there. And I hope you'll stick around. We have a few photos of our own. For sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, I hope people are still willing to show. So I'm going <laughs> I'm to hand the uh, mic over to Brian and he's going to show some um, local, more local wildlife sightings. Okay. Fabulous. Well, just bear with me just a moment. I'm terribly sorry. And uh, I've received a number this time from Susan, from John Sarimba, and also from uh, from Rod Anderson. So let's start. They're in no particular order. Uh, just. I'm terribly sorry, just bear with me just here a moment. Mm. 
So, so Laren, maybe just a question for you. Do you ever fly to Whitehorse and, and rent a vehicle and drive? I have once. I have once. The other times I've driven up. Um, and right now, flights are actually very cheap to Whitehorse. I'm actually flying up there in about a week for my first mm-hmm. winter trip. And the round trip flight was barely more than $200. It is winter and we are in, still in COVID, but it's pretty affordable. I mean, it's, it's still something, but, um, but I mean, it would be more expensive to drive up there with gas and, and then fly for $200. Now you have to rent a car and all that. But yeah, um, but yeah you can definitely fly up. And what are the car rentals like? Uh, there's lots of car rental options in, in Whitehorse and it's pretty much standard prices, I would say, compared to what you find elsewhere. Very good question. Because <laughs> yeah. there's other things to do around Whitehorse as well. So, for sure, yeah, there's there's lots to see, lots to do, and uh, although like June, July is the best time to see like the Northwest of British Columbia, like the Haines Triangle. If you go at any other time of year, you can see things like the Northern Lights and that sort of thing. So, <laughs> you must have seen the Northern Lights, even though when you've been up there during the summer. So I haven't because I've only been there in June and July. And in June and July, it doesn't get dark. The sun's Uh, white horse isn't that far north. So the sun sets at like 1130 um, and rises at like 330 or something like that. But the sun doesn't go far enough below the horizon. So you're just in twilight and it's not dark enough to see northern lights in the in the summer. But kind of August to April is kind of the northern light season. I've seen them down here, though. <laughs> can any can people see my screen now? Yes, you can. Okay, okay. Great. You can show us all your folders. <laughs> yeah, no, not 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 that exciting. I'm terribly sorry. There we go. There we go. Um, uh, Susan, um, you here? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, can, is, You'll have uh, to, cl- yeah. but I don't see the picture. It's just the the list. Oh, okay. Uh, we won't. Yeah, you have to click on something, Brian. Yeah. You have is to be f- very careful about which screen. Here. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, I understand. Uh, I'll. Uh, okay. Try it again. Yeah, let's try again. Let's try again. Share screen. Can can we see? Oh, fo- oh. we can see photos now. Yeah. yeah. So there we go. Um, I just, I'm crazy about um, dippers, and I see a lot of them on the streams behind my place, and I see them eating salmon eggs. But this one is a salmon alevin. So I was really lucky to be able to get that photo, I thought, because, you know, it gobbled it pretty quickly. Hmm. And Susan lives along the Coquitlam River. Okay, uh, Rod. Okay, um, this was uh, at Lafarge Lake. Uh, last Monday, and I, I saw I could I there was a lot of birds around, and I, I was watching, and I could see the shadow of this guy under the water, and he popped up, and he had something in his mouth. I couldn't tell what it was, so I just started taking pictures of him, and uh, I didn't actually see what it was until I got home and looked at it on the computer. But I think I, I believe that is a uh, Pied build grebe with some kind of sculpin. And I, I'm uh is there anybody that- if anybody can 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 uh confirm or, or clarify that, I'm I'd love to hear it. I was thinking of Jeff for the sculpin if if he's listening. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's definitely a sculpin. <laughs> Okay. Uh, prickly or coast range? I, I have no idea which one. Yeah. Okay. Definitely a pie bill grieve. 
There we go. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Larry. <laughs> Thank you very much. John Sarimba. Yes. Uh, are you able to hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. I always thought that uh, American dippers uh, tended to forage in fast flowing water. Much to our surprise at a recent walk at Minicata Park, there's an isolated pond just south of the large uh, duck ponds. And we watched for about 15 minutes this American dipper in this pond with uh, relatively stagnant water. And it was having a delightful time going under the water and pulling what I believe is possibly caddisfly larvae from the submerged logs, as well, sometimes the caddisfly will create its own shell of bits of bark. And it actually will come to the surface. The American Dipper came to the surface with this looked like a piece of bark, but it shook it hard enough that uh, the bark flew off and ended up with this lovely large larvae. Within about 15 minutes, uh, he probably gained about, or she gained about 50% of her weight. So I, I was pleasantly surprised with Christina as well that even in still water, you can find these little wonderful birds. Excellent. And John. Okay, uh, January, we've been doing a lot of nature walks and we've been fortunate to find some uh, species we don't normally see all that often. And we had uh, several different sightings at Minicata, Colony Farm, Beauville Slough, and this was actually, I believe, at the sanctuary at Hastings Park. And if you've never been to the sanctuary, which is a lovely urban park right beside Playland, PE grounds, highly recommended. It. It's a little oasis. And we stepped out of the car and there was two brown creepers. And every time I see this little photo, I feel like taking out a set of nail clippers. <laughs> you can see why they can easily <laughs> crawl up the tree. Wonderful little bird. Uh, recently, we went to Piper Spit, and it's nice to see spring here with the red winged blackbirds starting to serenade and create their territories. And it reminded me of a study I read about that the size of the ampullet on the shoulder, the redness, determines the ability for the uh, male to attract more in his harem. So the, the bigger the ampullet, the females figure, oh, this must be a stronger species. And they actually took one of the red-winged blackbirds that had about five females in his harem in this study, and they covered up his red patch. They let him go. The, the females wouldn't even look at him. They just ignored him. Wow. John again? Yeah. Uh, it's that time of the year. I, I just love this time of the year because the, the waterfowl and a lot of the birds are in their breeding colors. And it never ceases to fascinate me, the palette, the rich palette you have in nature. You can barely duplicate it you know, with watercolors or oils or acrylic. It's just, just amazing. And here's this lovely couple out for a morning stroll at Piper Spit. This is a, an interesting bird. I actually posted this on BC Bird because I, I wanted someone to give me the background of this bird. This is a, I think it's the custom, the way you say it, uh, Mallard, a female, and she's actually quite famous. Her name is Blondie. And someone was saying that she was actually, they thought she might have actually been born out there. She's not a pet. And she's had offspring. And they said that they've seen several offspring that are almost the same color in the local area. And I know that this past year, last summer, uh, Christy and I, when we were at Blakeburn, happened to see three almost the same color ducks at Blakeburn for a few days. So I'm just wondering if they were related somehow. It was just fascinating to, to see this kind of hybridization. And this was at Piper Spit once again. Beautiful bird. Now, 
Now that's not an egg, that's a tightless <laughs> golf ball. <That's> a... <laughs> <laughs> and what really fascinated me, this is at Piper Spit, the mud flats, have, when we were there, they probably had 30 to 40 golf balls. Hmm. And I was asking a couple of people how the golf balls got there. And apparently someone uh, intrepid volunteer goes and collects the golf balls off the mud flats to try and keep it looking a little more natural. Uh, I know that there's Burnaby golf courses near there. And I often wonder if the gulls or other birds pick up the golf balls off the driving range and happen to fly over and just drop them here. I couldn't figure out how they got here. But I, I thought it was rather unusual. And John again. Uh, this is a close up of uh, hoarfrost. And apparently, I, I did a little research and I put it in a Facebook post. There's actually two or three different types of this frost, depending on whether it's created by fog. And I, was, and I think the version that's created by fog is called. M-I-M-E, frost, and with the recent fog, this was taken at Burnaby Lake, I wondered then if it was uh, the moisture coming off the frost, I mean, off the fog that created this uh, lovely texture. Much to my delight, uh, we walked along from Piper spit over towards uh, the Brunette River along the trail at Burnaby Lake Park. And Christine and I probably saw four different Douglas squirrels. So it was so nice to see the, the native squirrels in addition to the uh, gray and the black squirrels. Lovely little creatures. And uh, one of the things that, uh, while this is not necessarily the greatest photograph in terms of there's the branches in the way, when I looked at this photograph quite closely, uh, I realized that the golden crown kinglet had, was really nicely attired. He's even got matching footwear compared to his little mullet. And it amazes me that anything with that skinny a leg can still be so acrobatic and, and maneuver so well. And we had a uh, pleasant walk uh, about a week ago along the shoreline trail. And for us, we haven't been seeing a lot of waterfall of Lake Burn Lagoons. So we were waterfall depraved or deprived. So we decided to go to Shoreline Trail and I highly recommend, we were quite surprised that if you go there during high tide, you get the greatest concentration of shorebirds. But in addition to the shorebirds, these are fresh buds, I think off an Indian plum, which is one of the earliest flowering shrubs in our area. And we were really entertained by a group of house finches, quite enjoying uh, the, the fresh green buds that day. Beautiful colors that photo. John? Okay, uh, I don't know, uh, I'm dating myself, but there used to be a show years ago uh, about the same time as the Twilight Zone and uh, the initial Mission Impossible. It's called Land of the Giants mm -hmm. or Gulliver's Travels as well. Well, while we were there, there's a, a small flock of Dunlins and they were foraging quite nicely around six killdeer. And everything was copacetic. Yeah, it was uh, the sunshine was starting to come out. And then all of a sudden, along comes this northern pintail. <laughs> and this photo doesn't do it justice how much bigger the pintail is than these little birds. And unfortunately, they had to stop their foraging. They were just having such a good time. It was so peaceful. And along comes this giant pintail marching right through the middle of them as they scattered. Okay, Susan. Well, I've, I have been seeing a mandarin duck um, in Coquitlam River Park lately, mostly on Oxbow Lake. 
And this was when the lake was frozen. And I got a picture of it walking on the ice. It's just such a beautiful bird. Yeah. I've got many, many photos of it because it's always there. It's just gorgeous. And that's it showing it's, I'm, I'm not sure what those are called, the, the parts of the wing that sticks up. I call them sails. Is it still there, Susan? It usually is. Uh, Larry Cowan and I were there uh, a few days ago. I think this is a different bird than the one that's found at Piper's Spit. This isn't Trevor. I'd heard that there was a competition, a newcomer yeah. in the area. Mm. And one of the interesting things is uh, Trevor at Piper's Spit has got a girlfriend who's bigger than he is. It's a, it's a wood duck. And I didn't realize, I looked it up and the wood duck is a distant cousin of the mandarin duck. Well, I've got a photo of them mating. Maybe that's next. <laughs> ah. Okay. I, I, okay. I might have had to keep that one out. I was going to uh, say, Brian I'm might have gonna... censored that one. Yeah. <laughs> that was, uh, you know, oh, that's not fair. No. Front control. Oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I mean, it's not the greatest photo, but if I hadn't been trying to focus, at that moment, I wouldn't have got it because that act lasted like two to three seconds. Yeah. So the mandarin was following the this female wood duck around a lot and finally got it. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see. I've heard that, you know, they can have offspring, even though the offspring won't be, um, won't breed themselves. Um, so I'll keep looking and see if we find hybridization yeah. there. Yeah. It'd be interesting. Yeah. Fabulous photo too. Just uh, mm -hmm. uh, extremely well timed. Yeah. <laughs> A little nuzzle there too. Yeah. <laughs> hmm? Rod. That's me again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is at Lafarge Lake as well. Um, this is an, uh, an otter, obviously. Uh, it, they're, uh, it, they, they've been seen around the uh, old beaver lodge quite a bit. And I'm wondering if maybe uh, they moved in to the beaver lodge. I don't know. Does anyone know if that, if that would nope. be a normal thing? No, I'm, I, don't, I don't know. They, they certainly are, are seen up and down the Coquitlam River as well. So, and... Uh... So Lafarge Lake isn't too far from the Coquitlam River. Okay, uh, and that's that's the end of our show. Uh, thank you so much, guys. Uh, apologies for the, um, the technical difficulties at the start there. Yeah, no problem, Bert. Um, so just a um, couple of announcements um, to let people know we have uh, a show and share coming up on February 17th, and that will be a, a birding adventure in Argentina with uh, Lee Harding. And then we have our uh, next uh, monthly Zoom uh, presentation. Uh, that'll be on March 10th, and that's the Evergreen Tunnel Reveals Geological History uh, with Professor Lionel Jackson. Um, and just, just a reminder um, that uh, memberships are due. It's $33 for individual or $40 for family. So unless, does anybody have any other questions? I'll, I'll just um, remind people that uh, the Friends of the Beauville Slough is now a subcommittee of the Burke Mountain Naturalists. And we'll be holding our first meeting of the FODBS as a committee on February 21st. And uh, everybody's welcome to come. There's uh, the uh, contact information is in the most recent newsletter if, if anybody wishes to uh, contact and come to the meeting. Great. And, and Jeff, that might be something to put on the um, on our website as well. But uh, we you can we can talk about that later. Okay. Great. Well, thanks very much, everybody, for for coming out, uh, or maybe I shouldn't say coming out, staying at home. And, um, and it's a great way of having a meeting and sharing photos and everything else. So thanks very much. And, you know, a great, great thank you to our guest presenter, Fabulous.
So right. thanks That's again. So, so everybody have a, have a great night and, um, and we'll maybe see a, a few of you in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Thanks again. Good night. Thanks. Thanks again. Thank you. Yeah. It's fantastic. Good night. <laughs>